Uh, I had the privilege of meeting Max. He's a pastor in Saxony, Texas at Park Lake Baptist Church. And um, Max was doing a wonderful job, very creative, very innovative, trying to do things that's fresh and new. And uh, he hired one of my best friends as one of his pastors on staff. So that drew a common bond, and I got to follow Max's ministry. And he had been at this church for 18 years. And the church doing a wonderful job growing, thriving in missions, uh, taking on different missionaries and supporting different projects. And after a few years of having a passion for missions, God changed the direction within his life. And he said, instead of being a senior pastor in Saxe, Texas, I want you to be a missionary in Nicaragua. So at the age of 46 years of age, Max changes complete direction uh, from being a sender of missionaries to be a missionary that needs to be sent. So a few months ago, Max calls me up and he says, Bruce, he said, I need to uh, have a few churches um, uh, endorse me so I can become a missionary of the Baptist Bible Fellowship so I can go into the, church, into the field of Nicaragua. So, of course, Max, being a friend, knowing what he has done, I said, I think Glenville would be thrilled to be part of the endeavor of Nicaragua and you serving in that capacity. So Max now has started his full-time deputation, resigned his church, and now I think this is his fifth church that he's been in on the endeavor of raising support to get to Nicaragua to start his brand new ministry. I did not ask him to come today to talk about Nicaragua. I want to come today and go, we're going to finish out our series on faith, hope, and love. The greatest of this is love. But what I'd like him to do is I'd like to him to share his heart. Because talking about a field is not talking about the missionary. And I want you to get to know the heart and the passion of Max and Jennifer Kennedy. Good friends of ours. They've done a wonderful job as a pastor. I know they're going to do a wonderful job as a missionary because the heart... The heart, when you love people and you love what you do and you have a passion for what God is doing within your life and you have an ear that God says, I need you to change directions. I need you to do something new. And you, the fear, the anxiety, you say, I, I know what I'm doing here. I've got this part down. And God says, I know you have what you have down. But I want you to do what I have planned for you. And you say, okay. Be ready because the roller coaster ride of life is about ready to start. And what we get to do from the sideline watching what Max is going to do, we get to watch him go up and down, scream at the top of his lungs. But at the bottom of the line, when the roller coaster ride is over, we get to say we were part of this great adventure called changing people's lives, not only in Wichita, but in Nicaragua. We're excited about Max being here. He did a great job last night for us during our, mission, during our Valentine's banquet. And I've asked him to come today and share with us about love. Well, thank you, Bruce. And uh, we appreciate this opportunity to be with Glenville. Good morning, Glenville. Good morning. All right, you are awake. We'll see what we can do about that. You know, they say if you lay every person down from head to toe that falls asleep in church in the world, they'd all be a lot more comfortable. So um, just go ahead, find your place to stretch out. Now, today uh, we are going to talk and finish this series out for Bruce. I, I'm so privileged for the opportunity to come and, and do that. Um, as Bruce mentioned, I have been a senior pastor for 23 years. Uh, 18 of the last 23 years have been in one church, Park Lake Church in Saxe, Texas. We built a life there. All of our kids grew up there, graduated from high school there, married there, having kids there. I uh, already have six grandkids with two on the way. So I'll have eight grandkids in about six months. And I know I look so young. I know. Can you believe it? I actually have hair. I just shave it so I look older. That's a lie. But anyway... We're so thankful that you invited us to come now as missionaries. It was a very difficult uh, decision, but God led us the entire way. M myself, uh, I have been to Nicaragua 14 times on missions trips. My wife and I have led over 200 people on missions trips all over the world, but primarily in Nicaragua where our church fell in love with a little community there, and we decided to adopt called La Esmeralda. 
It is a coffee-growing region of the northern, central northern mountains there in Nicaragua where Starbucks has literally contracts with all those farmers out there. Dunkin' Donuts, that's where all their coffee comes from. It's some of the best coffee in the world. We uh, fell so much in love with this tiny farm community that uh, we decided as a church to purchase a coffee plantation there. We actually decided that our church, to, in, order, in order to show the people we were serious about loving them and having a long-term relationship with them, we decided to purchase a small coffee farm. It's not huge. It's probably about six acres. It has 18,000 coffee trees on it, though, and it produces just enough uh, money to be sold there in country to fund the ministries of the church like their sports ministry. So we adopted this community. We helped build their very first church building. Uh, we literally sent a team for two weeks to build and construct the first parts of that building. Now this, this ministry is one of the most thriving of the eight works that we will begin working with immediately, eight churches. It has a, a church. It has a sports uh, uh, Sports activity uh, ministry pulls in teens from all over the mountains. It has a feeding center that was with manna. And also we have now a fully functioning and fully funded hospital clinic there in La Esmeralda. And so we have set kind of a pattern for what we hope to share with other churches and say, would you please consider maybe even Glenville, coming to Nicaragua on a trip, seeing a community that you too could fall in love with and say, this is where we would like to set up Glenville in Nicaragua and help us with project-driven ministries to purchase land, build buildings, uh, build clinics, uh, feeding centers, sports ministries. And I hope someday that many of you here will actually come and see me in Nicaragua. So that's our passion, that's our dream, that's our goal. I would appreciate your prayers for that. Now, today we're going to be talking about love, and last night we had such a wonderful, wonderful uh, time together. Um, I was, though, uh, kind of discouraged when I found out that there's video evidence for how much fun we had last night. Um, I haven't seen it yet, but I really don't want to. Hopefully it won't hit uh, any uh, social media sites. But anyway, we had a great time last night if you missed it. Um, well, you just missed it. But we're here today, and I tell you what, I feel good. Do you feel good? Amen. I do too. You know, I, though, Bruce, next time I come, if, if I get to come back for breakfast on Sunday morning, I want whatever Bryson had, your bass player. That cat was moving all over the place. Way to go, Bryson. I want that. That's a breakfast of champions, whatever he's eating. So uh, let's get started. We're actually finishing out this series, Faith, Hope, and Love. I went online and actually uh, watched uh, the previous couple of services and a wonderful job done by your pastor. I'm so privileged to be asked to, to end this series up. Um, but today what I would like to do is kind of equate this whole sermon, if you want to call it a sermon or a lesson or a message, to a, a lesson, a kind of a private, semi-private Lesson. How many of you have ever had some kind of private lessons? Would you raise your hand? Raise your hand up high. Any kind. Of, now, that's not bragging. You're just saying you needed a lot of help with something, right? <laughs> You're not bragging. You just needed some help. And that was me. You know, whenever, whenever I was in um, first grade, my teacher approached my mother and told her that she really think, thought that I needed uh, some speech classes because I had a speech impediment. And I wasn't even aware of it as a little kid. I had a speech impediment. I didn't talk a whole lot because people didn't understand me in first grade. And so for about 30 minutes a day for several weeks, I went and had speech classes. And it worked because I haven't shut up since. And, uh, but that's one example of some private lessons that I had as a very young kid. And then when I was 12 years old, I went to my mom and said, I want to take piano lessons. And now you have to understand how out of character this was for me as a 12-year-old boy. I was always outside, getting dirty, playing mud, played football in pads since I was five years old all the way through high school. I mean, I was the jock type that was outside all the time. And she says, piano lessons? You want to take piano lessons? I said, yes, I really do. Now, she didn't know the motivation. I had just been to a junior high camp where I watched a guy play the piano and a dozen girls crowd around him <laughs> ooing and aahing, and I thought, that's what I want. <laughs> so she signed me up for music lessons, and it happened to be my old third grade teacher, Mrs. May, and I hated it. 
Never practiced, never really got any good. But that's another example. So today what I want to do is together us take a semi-private lesson on love. Maybe you've had that similar experience. Maybe you signed up for some lessons in the past. Well, today we're going to just give you a primer, if you will. This is just your first lesson right out of the box. This will not get you where you need to go. That's what I'm trying to say. We end here today, everybody's not going to just be loving like they ought to love. But I'm going to give you a primer. I'm going to give you some basic tools that if you will take what you learned today and you run with and you do the homework that I'm even going to give you at the end, I really think that your love quotient, your love ability will go up. And that's what this is all about today. It's going to be really taking a lifetime of learning to get the benefit of this lesson, but we're going to take a love lesson together. Whether you know you need it or not, I think all of us could learn to love better. You agree? Now, wives, don't elbow your husbands at that point. This is not going to be a lesson on buying flowers, chocolates, and jewelry. And guys, I'm sorry, but this is not a lesson about your wife being in the mood more often or how to fight through a headache. That's not what this lesson's going to be. We're actually not going to focus on romantic love at all because we all understand there's different kinds of loves, right? There's different kinds of love. There's brotherly love. There is romantic love. There's love you have for your children, love for your friends, love for your parents, love for your spouse. And we're going to look at the root, though, of all those different manifestations of love. Our lesson today is about loving others like God loves us. Now, the cool thing about that is, is when you do learn to love more like God loves you, it will magnify all of the different manifestations of love we just described. Maybe you do need some lessons on romantic love. Well, if you learn to love more like God loves, then guess what? Your romantic love will improve. Um, if you learn to love like God loves, then you'll love your brother better. You'll love your friends better. You'll love your spouse, your kids. Even that annoying guy at your office, you will love him better if you learn to love like God loves. Now, the awesome thing about this lesson on love is that there's a textbook available to us. And uh, you don't even have to go out and buy this textbook. Many of you probably have it in your lap. Others of you, if you have a smartphone, you can download on version this textbook for free. It's the Bible. But not just the whole Bible. There is a specific passage in the Bible that you've been focusing on and we're going to end on today. And it's 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So if you have your iPhones or tablets or your Bibles, turn there to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And what we're going to do, though, is a little different. Actually, you can probably put those down. I want you all to stand up with me, okay? We're going to try something different. I'm going to have this put up on the screens. Now, this is the New International Version. And I want us all, I know this is a big crowd, so we're going to have to really work hard together, and everyone's going to have to participate. And this is kind of a long passage of Scripture. But I would like for us to all read this out loud together. Okay? So we're all looking at the screen and here we go. Ready, everyone? If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. 
Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Father, we are grateful for your scripture. We are grateful for the Apostle Paul pinning this amazing definition of love. Father, even the world recognizes his words as something to behold. Those who would claim that there is no God, those who would claim that the Bible is just a book of fairy tales would still take this passage and say, that's amazing, because it is the greatest definition we have ever written on love. Now help us to take that first lesson today to understand the question, what is love? In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Thank you. Give yourselves a hand. You did a wonderful job. <clears throat> now, today's lesson is entitled, What is Love? It's a good question. Poets have written about it. Songs have been written about it. Philosophers have written volumes about it. Artists have painted it, drawn it, and sculpted it. Scientists have tried to analyze it, measure it. Even graffiti artists have tried to depict it on bathroom stalls. I mean, what am I going to tell you today that's new about love? Nothing. That's what. And we're not going new school on this one. We're going old school. There's a passage of Scripture I want you to see just to kind of set up what we're going to learn today. And it's 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. It'll be on your screen. It says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is born of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is what? The bright. God is love. Now we learn two quick facts. Love comes from God. And secondly, God is love. Love comes from God and God is love. And since those two facts are true, then that gives me the big idea for today's lesson. And here it is. It's on the screen. Love is is a reflection of who God is, how God acts, and how God thinks. That's your basic definition of real love. It is the reflection. It is nothing that we can produce on our own. Truly, if it were not for God, we would not exist. We exist because God loved to create us. And the only way we love is because God first loved us. He put love in our being so that even if we do not have a relationship with him through his son, on some level, <coughs> on some level we still can love. We have brotherly love. We have love for others. And the only reason that we can love is because it is a reflection, a reflection of God. So one of the best proofs that God truly exists is the fact that you can love someone and can be loved. God exists, therefore love exists, since God is love, and you and I love as a result of him. Love is the essence of God. It's one of his overarching characteristics. Love exists because God exists. And the fact that you and I love each other proves that God exists. Have you ever heard the word agape before? You know that word, you've heard it. It is the Greek word for love, one of the Greek words for love. That word is the word used in the passage that we just all read together. And we have all, if you know that word, you may have heard it defined before. Agape love is most often defined as God's love. That's God's love. But actually, the better definition is loving God like God loves God people. Love, I'm sorry, loving people like God loves people. That's the definition. Loving others like God loves me. Or loving 
people like God loves people. So that's our definition. Now if we go back to those first three verses, we're going to build our lesson together. We're going to go here. I'm going to show you where we're going. I'm going to show you three things that love is. Three things that love actually multiplies or magnifies or, or gives meaning to. All right, and we're going to go back to these passages of Scripture, the first three verses, and find out just how important love is when it comes to our lives. So are you ready? Here we go. Verse number one. I'm going to read it to you. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Now let me reread it again, but put our definition that we just came up with in there instead of love. I'm going to read it this way. If I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but I don't love people like God loves people, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So what is love? Our first understanding is love is the meaning of my message. Love is the meaning of of my message. In other words, if I'm not loving people like God loves people, then no matter what I say or how I say it, it will not make sense. I'm just going to be making noise. My middle son, Brady, when he was in middle school, he was, uh, he was in the band. And uh, it was always kind of fun to go to their performances. You know, they were just kind of getting started. Not really good, to be quite honest with you. Only a parent would love to be there. <laughs> and uh, we were there in the band, and I can remember this one occasion that they were playing. And uh, they had this <sighs> overexcited cymbal player. He was in the back, and the whole way through this piece of music, he was like rocking back and forth. Like, uh-oh, here comes my part. Here comes my part. And then when his part would come, he'd go... <laughs> And he'd look and smile and let his mom, you know, and, then, and everybody was watching him. And all that piece of music I can remember is, that's the only thing I can remember from the entire performance. I can't remember what song it was. I don't remember what it sounded like. And in the same way, that's what Paul's saying. He's saying, look, you can be eloquent. You can speak very well. You can say all the right things to all the right people at all the right times. But if that message is not coupled with loving people like God loves people, then all it is is psh, 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 psh. There's no meaning to your message. Your communication is void. There's no purpose really in it. Now, a lot of people try to make a case for speaking in tongues out of verse 1, but that's not even what Paul's teaching there. He's using what scholars call a hyperbole to teach the truth. An exaggeration. He's basically saying, look, even if I could speak in every known language, and even if I could speak with the eloquence of angels, and I don't love the people I'm talking to like God loves them, all they're going to hear is psh, psh, psh. It's the old saying. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So how does this play out in real life? I mean, is this practical? Well, husbands, do you ever wonder why your wife gets upset when you're honest with her? Maybe your honesty isn't being coupled with love. By the way, um, on a side note, ladies, it is never, never a good idea to ask your husband, does this make me look fat? You set us up for failure no matter what. Because he's thinking if I say yes, then I'm sleeping on a couch. But if I say no, she'll think she just looks fat and it's not the dress's fault. And even if I answer, you have never and never will look fat to me, honey. You're perfect. You're just going to call us a liar. So just don't ask that question. But the truth, seriously, guys, when you're honest with your wife and you feel she gets upset with you, is it because maybe you're not coupling that honesty with love? Wives, do you ever wonder why your husband complains about you always griping? Well, maybe it's because you're not seasoning your suggestions with love. Because you wouldn't say you're griping, you're giving us suggestions, right? But are you seasoning them with love? 
Maybe your kids aren't responding to your correction. Well, love is the meaning of your message. Love them like God loves them. Let that be the motivation behind your correction instead of your motivation being that they're just annoying the heck out of you. See, Paul has done us a great favor here. He has given us the key to being really understood. He's given us the key to communicating on the highest level possible. Now, if you just want to be heard, then go ahead and clang away without loving people. You'll be heard, but people will turn you off. But if you want to be heard and understood, if you want to communicate at the deepest level with people who are closest to you, then you must love them first. Loving them like God loves them. Now, let's look at verse 2. Verse 2, he says, If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Now let me reread it again with our definition. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but I do not love people like God loves people, I am nothing. So that means then, secondly, love is the magnifier of my ministry. It's the magnifier of my ministry. Now this one hits me square between the eyes because, as I mentioned, I was a pastor for 23 years. Um, my last Sunday as a senior pastor was December 29th, just a few weeks ago. And um, Bruce, I know you'll understand this probably better than anyone else here today, but Ministry is never fun, it's never easy, and it's never meaningful if it's not done out of love. Isn't that true? It's, it's never fun. It's never easy, it's never meaningful if my ministry is not done out of love. And I've been there. I have ministered out of obligation. I have ministered because I was expected to minister, not fun. I've ministered because I've been told to minister. Not fun. But you know what? Not only is it not fun, it's not productive. It has no power. Ministry is impotent without love. Let me ask you a theological question. And I know you don't have time to think about this kind of stuff. You know, you got your kids to raise, you got your jobs to do, you got all the stuff to run them around after school and all of that, and you don't sit down and you just think about things like this, but I think it might be helpful for our lesson here today. Why do you think Jesus washed the disciples' feet? Just think about it for a second. You don't have to answer out loud. But just think. Why did Jesus wash the disciples' feet? It's a good question. Think about it. Now, I'm sure we could probably think of a lot of reasons. One, to teach them how to serve. Maybe to give an example of humility. You know, Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Humility. Maybe to show what it looks like to really be a servant of all. Those are all good reasons. They're all good lessons. But why did he do it? What made it such a powerful lesson? He loved them. He loved them. Why did Jesus wash their feet? He loved them. Ask yourself this question, and here's how we make it practical. Why do I do what I do for others? Think about it. Why do you do what you do for other people? Teenagers, why do you really clean your room? when you do is it just because mom and dad have threatened your life is it just because the government's about to make it a hazardous zone and you're going to have to move is it just because you finally can't stand the stink and the ants and the grossness yourself I mean really when it boils down to it why do you clean your room Moms and dads, why do you really help your kids with their homework? Do you not have better things to do? Husbands, 
Why do you put the toilet seat down? Is it just because you know she's going to gripe at you? Or do you love her? Wives, why do you pick up our underwear when we leave it on the floor? All of those things are magnified. Our love magnifies what we do to others. And if we don't have love, it's just another task. It's just another duty. But when it's love, it takes it to a whole new level of ministry. This is very practical stuff. Those mundane, sometimes even yucky things we do for other people take on a whole new meaning when we love the person that we're doing those things for like God loves them. Let me just ask you for a second. Why are you involved in ministry here at Glenville? Why, why do you serve and volunteer in the nursery? You know, why do you volunteer to greet people? Why do you teach a class? Why do you cook a meal when someone is sick? Why, why do you work with teenagers? Why do you play an instrument or, or sing? Why are you doing those things? I'm telling you, if the first and foremost motivation for all those things is not love, then those things equal nothing. That's what... Paul said. He says, if I can do all these things for other people and I have all of these abilities, even faith that can move mountains, but I don't have love, it doesn't amount to nothing. Verse 3. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Let's reread it. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but I do not love people like God loves people, I gain nothing. So what is love? Love is the multiplier of my mission. It's the multiplier. God is, is, is telling us here that without love, no matter what, our accomplishments or our, our task or our mindset or, or what we plan to do for him, those things will not come to anything without loving people. So Paul's talking about sacrifice and surrender here. God calls on every one of us to sacrifice and surrender our lives to him. He asks each of us to give. He asks each of us to sacrifice. He even asks us to be willing to die for him. How meaningless how fruitless would our life mission be without love? You want to see just how meaningless missions is or mission in life is without love? To give you a taste of what sacrifice and service and surrender would look like without love, I'm going to quote you the most famous verse of Scripture, but I'm going to leave something out. See if you can spot it. Let's put it on the screen. John 3, 16. He gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Anybody spot what was left out? What was it? For God so loved the world. Now, without that, though, let's look at that for a second. There is a message. Is there not? I mean, there is a certainly a, a ministry there. And, and there's even a mission. I mean, without that first part, we understand that God gave his son. We understand the reason so that everyone who believes will have eternal life. But what are we missing? We're missing the motivation. God so loved the world. That instantly brings meaning to the message. It multiplies that ministry. It magnifies God's mission to save you and I. So if you're here this morning and you've never experienced the forgiveness that God offers, if you have never experienced God's love, I would encourage you today before you leave here to open your heart and receive the gift that only God can give. For God so loved you. That's why Jesus came. That's why this church exists, is to tell you that God loves you. 
you, you may be here for a lot of different reasons in your mind. Maybe someone invited you here. Maybe your husband or wife drug you here. Maybe somebody promised to take you out to eat afterwards if you'd come. And you think that you're here for all of those different reasons. I'm telling you here for what? One of the reasons you're here is because a long time ago, God purposed you to be here in this service today to hear this truth. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you so much that he gave up his own son to die a cruel death to be buried in a borrowed tomb. And then on the third day, though, God's love was so great for you that that wasn't the end of the story. Jesus Christ rose again, defeating sin, defeating death. And he did it all for you. And he didn't do it just because someone told him to. He didn't do it just because, well, it just, you know, if no one else does, and I got to. No, why did he do that? Because he loved you. God loves you. And if you want to receive that love, it's really, it's really all about just receiving. It's, it's about believing, and it's about receiving. First of all, do you believe that Jesus loves you? Do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you? And if so, then just receive the gift of salvation. Well, Max, how do I do that? Well, it's just like any other thing. You, you simply thank him for the gift and take it. He's offering it to you today. And you could just thank him in a prayer similar to this, say, God, I understand that you love me. I've never really grasped it before, but now I receive your love and I receive your gift. Thank you for offering it to me. I accept it. I accept Jesus. Some of you need to do that today. You've thought about it. You've been here before and you've heard it, but you've left thinking maybe some other day, well, this is the some other day. Don't leave here today without receiving a beautiful gift motivated out of love for you. He created you and he loves you. And then for the rest of us here that have already experienced God's love, I have to ask you, why do you do what you're doing? Are you seasoning your communication with your spouse and your children with love? Are you seasoning your communication with your boss and your coworkers with love? Because if you are not, then they hear you. But the meaning of your message is being lost. That's why some of you resorted to threats. Some of you resort to making people feel guilty is because you're not loving the people that you're talking to. Some of us need to confess that today. We need to come forward, get on our knees, and say, Lord, my problem's not communication skills. It's I'm lacking love. Will you help me love others like you love them? What about ministry? Has it become mundane, predictable, and boring? Then become a missionary. <laughs> it's none of those. Seriously, no, couple what you're doing with love. Go back to your first love. Remember why you started ministering in the first place. It was out of that sense of God's love for you and his ministry to you. And if you're just ministering because to fill a slot or because no one else is going to do it and that's in your mind as to why you're doing it, listen, it'll fizzle. And that's why you're feeling tired. That's why you're feeling depressed. It happens to pastors, it happens to nursery workers, it happens to youth pastors, it happens to musicians, it happens to anyone who's ministering out of anything but the motivation of love. And what about your mission? Do you think maybe the reason you have never walked across the street and invited your neighbor to church, well, it's just not a good time. I don't know, they might, you know, think I'm a weirdo. Do you really think maybe, let's be honest, the reason that you haven't done that yet, you don't really love them? I, and I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to, to help you out here. Because if you really, really love them like God loves them, you wouldn't let anything else stand in your way to at least invite. Not annoy the heck out of, but invite. 
and continue to pray for them. Is that maybe the reason you've never, ever shared your faith or led someone to Christ? Is maybe because you've not experienced this kind of love for that person. Today, I think it's time we confess that it's love because the greatest thing out of faith and hope and love is love. Your faith is nothing. All the hope you have and the firm belief of something happening doesn't matter if you don't love. So here's your homework. And then we're going to ask you to come and just simply get on your knees in a moment. Confess where you need to love people, how you need to love first. But here's your homework, okay? Your, your mission. You've been given a mission. It's, it's, it's to go and share your faith with others. But those two commandments, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbors as yourself, that's, your, that's, that's the two most important commands. So here's what I want you to do. Now that you've been given your lesson on love, like anything else you hope to get better at, you got to go and practice. So here we go. I, I want you to, this week, every single day, read 1 Corinthians 13. We just read it all together. It took us a couple of minutes. You could do it by yourself even faster. Every day this week, and what I want you to focus on is verses 4 through 8, the part that we really didn't focus on today. And I want you to ask, which acts of love do I need to include that is telling me love is? And what things is it telling me that love is not that I need to exclude? Which acts of selfishness do I need to exclude? And that's your homework. It'll help you practice this lesson on love. Read 1 Corinthians 13, the whole chapter. It's not long. You saw yourself. Focus on verses 4 through 8 where he says, love is not, love is not, love is not, and love is, and love is, and love is. Add the is's minus the nots. And see how you've been reacting to certain relationships. But I think it's time for us, folks, to remember that none of this matters. Being here today does not matter. Me, me preaching this lesson to you does not matter. Glenville's ministry here in this town does not matter. My mission's work in Nicaragua does not matter. It amounts to absolutely nothing if we are not all loving others like God loves others. Can you imagine what would happen if just this church, just Glenville, started really getting it right? Wow. Can you imagine the difference you would make not just in this town, but in this state, in this country, just this group of people right here, if we could really start doing everything we're doing motivated by loving others like God loves them, you couldn't keep people out of here with a shotgun. They'd want to be, participate in everything you're doing because that's the meaning of the message. That is the multiplier of this ministry, and it is the magnifier of the mission Jesus left us to do. Let's bow our heads together. Our Heavenly Father, today we've done our best to just present the basics. That really everything we do in this life should be motivated out of love. God, we are so grateful for the love that you have showed us. Every single day of our lives, things that we see and things that we do not see, how you love us unconditionally now God it, if you could just help us love others like you have loved us it will take everything we're doing to a new level of purpose significance and meaning so Lord I pray you'll move in each individual heart in the way that you need to to help them confess the lack of love in whatever relationship whatever ministry whatever thing they've been doing and make the commitment today to do their homework. Start including the what love is in 1 Corinthians 13. And start excluding what love is not. And see how it affects the relationships in their family and work in this community as a church. And Lord, I just know we're going to hear amazing things happening out of Glenville 
church here in Wichita. Thank you for this opportunity in Jesus' name. With your head still bowed, if there's anyone here today that has never experienced that love, never really accepted it, listen, you've experienced it because you're alive. You're alive because God loves you. You have your job, your home, the possessions you have is all because God loves you. You have your family because God loves you. <clears throat> but have you ever received the greatest gift of love he has ever extended to you, and that is your salvation? Today, if you have not, then I encourage you to come forward and take Pastor Bruce by the hand and just say, will you pray with me? I want to receive the gift of eternal life that Max was talking about. For the rest of us, I, I think really we ought to be honest with ourselves and confess where we have not loved. This, these steps down here are open to you in just a moment for you to come. Kneel in God's presence. Maybe you need to bring your loved one, your family with you and just say, hey guys, look, we've not been loving each other like we have. Let's pray that God will help us. Let's all stand to our feet. Heads are bowed. As a